But we have a spectacular lineup for you guys, um, so I don't think it'll be disappointing at all. Um, but first, I'd like to kind of do a shameless promotion, <laughs> if I may. Uh, we just had our Charter of Internet Rights and Principles uh, with IRP Coalition translated into Turkish. It's right off the press. Um, Selin Kaladenan uh, translated it for us. Um, if you're interested, grab one copy we'd love to have. Uh, you guys distributed. Uh, Free Miles also just released a uh, fantastic report too, so ask us about that too. Now, a um, couple of ground rules, if I may, um, since we have a lot of great panelists, um, I'd like to mention uh, some of the ground rules. I I'm the timekeeper, by the way. I'm the evil person. Um, so this is going to be an interactive dialogue instead of a panel. Um, so for the sake of time management, um, we're going to address certain questions to certain people. It doesn't mean that other, other panelists don't have any opinions about it, but we can talk about the, those after, after the session when we have more time, but we just kind of handpick a couple of people who would be, you know, more, I don't know, um, I don't know, we just kind of handpick a couple of people. So all speakers will get three minutes. Um, we do want audience participation because it's interactive dialogue. We're going to let audience speak in the middle and in the end we've uh, tried to allot um, ample time for you guys to ask your questions. Uh, audience will get two minutes and uh, maximum two, um, two comments. Um, so we, we ask that, and I know this is a very heated topic and we're all passionately involved in this, otherwise we wouldn't be here at eight, 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, but we do, we do ask you to keep things on topic and we do ask that um, uh, maybe not get into the political backstories uh, too much, the political context, because we're, most of us are already familiar with um, them, so just to kind of keep things very focused. Um, and and one, of, one of our personal requests from you guys, um, from the audience, if you can live tweet the event as best as you can, uh, that would be awesome. Because of the sensitive uh, nature of the topic, uh, we want all the information to get out there and not get nixed. Uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, in this, uh, in this, in this way, internetrightsandprinciples.org will be live blogging it, and uh, Robert Bodel, my fantastic colleague here, is going to be live tweeting it because I tweeted his uh, panel, so he's owed, he owes me a favor. But you guys do it too. So our hashtag is well at IGF2014, but also at NetRights. Um, uh, anyway, Nate will kick off the questions and then we'll rotate um, one after the other. And um, so I guess with that, I'll turn it over to Nate. Great. Um, so I'm just going to start just kind of framing out what we're talking about. Uh, what we want to focus on in the workshop are cases where online freedom, access to information online are restricted purposefully. They're restricted by one of the stakeholders in the multi-stakeholder equation. Um, we're talking about this not so that we can single out uh, individual governments, individual corporations, individual entities, but because this is a big part of what is happening in internet governance. We have a situation where uh, in a multi-stakeholder environment, sometimes one of the stakeholders is not acting in good faith. And this poses a lot of questions for how to preserve an open internet. Um, so that's what we want to focus on. Uh, I think at, after we've moved through some discussion of very specific cases, very specific responses, what we want to do is hopefully widen it out to talk about some of the implications for multi-stakeholderism itself and what does that mean for the multi-stakeholder, uh, the global multi-stakeholder uh, model when at the national level, at the national multi-stakeholder level, there is a lack of good faith or a lack of trust due to this dynamic. Um, so in particular, to get us kicked off, what we want to start with is some real short capsule descriptions from a few of our participants of, um, in particular, some of the newer and more subtle forms of restriction of speech, restriction of access to information online. We're focusing on newer and more subtle forms because I think we talk a lot about some of the bigger picture stuff that we see all the time, the really flagrant censorship, the really flagrant blocking. But uh, as everyone knows, the, the picture is evolving very rapidly. We're seeing some more sophisticated technical approaches that are harder to track. Uh, things like DNS hijacking, things like throttling, things like filtering. Um, we're seeing attacks on circumvention itself. Um, we're also seeing uh, growing surveillance without court orders 
um, without transparent mechanisms that we can then monitor. And we're also seeing um, rhetorical, political attacks on the internet and on social media itself. Um, efforts to delegitimize the internet and social media as a space where information is legitimately shared. So this is uh, a big picture. We're covering a lot of ground. Um, we're doing it because all of these are what comes together to create a chilling, uh, a chilled environment for speech and a spe uh, an environment in which self-censorship becomes widespread. Um, so I want to start out with just some quick statements from a few of our workshop uh, participants. Um, I wanted to go to Shahzad, uh, to Shahzad Ahmad first. Uh, thank you, Nate. Uh, I will, uh, uh, my name is Shahzad, Shahzad Ahmed from uh, Bites for All uh, Pakistan. We are based in uh, Islamabad, the capital city, but we work uh, throughout the country and our work mainly is in, 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 in Pakistan. Um, I, would, I, would, I would mention three issues uh, uh, just to start with this discussion. Um, we, have, we have recently published uh, Pakistan's first ever hate speech study. Uh, it was launched on 7th June, and uh, we wanted to understand, I mean, exactly what new forms of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, censorship and uh, surveillance are in place and what are the issues around it. So, uh, uh, it actually gave us really alarming uh, uh, results, and it, 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 it outlines that how many groups and how different people are being targeted in uh, and in cyberspace. And this study is uh, online at uh, bitesforall.pk. You can you can look at it whenever you uh, you, you you get a bit of time. Uh, so that was one. Uh, other than that, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, Pakistani government is investing a lot into uh, filtering. Uh, Softwares. So, so it is all coming from defense budget. It's not uh, 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 really, I mean, you, you hardly get to know about it, that how and what is being spent, uh, because uh, defense budget is not audited. So it's, it's, it's uh, something where, you know, uh, uh, I mean, they, they can do, they can spend as much money they want. So that is one thing. Uh, NetSweeper, uh, for example, there are other uh, uh, filtering softwares as well, which are being employed right now. Um, uh, NetSuper was, um, we know only because it was discovered uh, through a research and uh, field research uh, uh, by Citizen Lab and Bytes for All, uh, because we had a network of uh, field monitors in, throughout the country and we could, we could assess it. Um, other than that, uh, the, the, the impunity uh, is, is being strengthened uh, using different laws impunity around these censorship actions that government uh, is uh, uh, employing, uh, deploying. So uh, new laws are being made uh, to, to legitimize and uh, strengthen this uh, uh, culture of impunity. Uh, and and uh, for that, I mean, we, we, we know that there is a, a couple of laws which are extremely predatory, not only towards uh, larger human rights, but to online freedom of expression as well. And then, uh, then the newest uh, step is uh, um, uh, an NGO law uh, uh, that essentially has the potential to uh, literally kill uh, uh, independent human rights uh, movement or independent uh, 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 any civil rights movement in, 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 the, in the country. So, I mean, these are the new developments that we are seeing. I'll Great. stop here and then. That's perfect. Um, I wanted to go next to Gönenç Gurkanak from Turkey. Um, thank you for this. Uh, this is Gönenç Gürkaynak. I'm, I'm an attorney at law, um, um, a managing partner at a law firm in Istanbul. Um, my um, uh, main concern about the new, more sophisticated techniques of uh, suppressing um, expression over the internet, um, as, as Nate has also gave uh, some examples like uh, throttling, for example, or uh, DNS hijacking, um, is that there's no transparency about this. So the uh, words transparency, accountability are becoming more and more important for the, the internet world and internet law is less and less a technical separate legal discipline and more and more it's becoming a matter of fundamental uh, rights and freedoms in ways that we're very used to it, uh, like transparency is needed in all of these uh, fundamental rights uh, concepts uh, and, and the same is happening with 
uh, the internet. The DNS hijacking has happened uh, in this country. And uh, uh, it also signals that sometimes enforcers uh, take it too far. Uh, they no longer think in jurisdictional parameters, but they go after particular stakeholders and, and want to make sure that it hurts. Uh, and that's obviously a questionable public policy preference. Uh, and uh, more importantly, the more there are going to be sophisticated technologies of taking down certain content, the less there will be uh, uh, data in the hands of people. Today, people are at least able to say that about 51,000 websites are uh, brought down in Turkey. Uh, about every year, 15,000 uh, websites are being uh, access banned. Uh, and this number has been increasing over time. Uh, uh, and we also know that Turkey is uh, uh, highly likely the world champion in uh, removing content uh, because of uh, some transparent reports, uh, uh, like the Google Transparency Report or the Twin Twitter Transparency Report, which are publicly available and everybody knows about it. Uh, but the more the technology gets sophisticated and uh, certain uh, stakeholders in the internet world are uh, being targeted without their involvement, the less these transparency reports are going to reflect the actual uh, situation, the severity of the, of the situation, because uh, they are going to be placed as the subject matter of enforcement rather than a counterpart in the enforcement. They won't know what type of a, of a volume is hitting them, or at least they won't always know about this. Um, so um, wrapping up, I would say that uh, the, there shouldn't be an underground enforcement that is available to, uh, to states, uh, and uh, all methods of enforcement should be uh, out there, and some of them should be, uh, should be tagged uh, through uh, these kinds of efforts like IGF and, and other ways of better governance. Uh, they should be tagged as a no-no. For, uh, for governments, much as you wouldn't, uh, in some countries, uh, uh, condone for uh, castration as a, uh, as a remedy, or you wouldn't allow for uh, capital punishment, or you wouldn't allow for torture as a means of punishment, or any, any means of anything, really, uh, then uh, I think some of these sophisticated technologies of enforcement may be, over time, uh, in the future, uh, be tagged as, uh, as a no-no. Uh, these are not methods of enforcement. These are just me methods of torturing the Internet. Uh, throttling, for example, uh, Thank you. is a good example We're gonna of that. Thank you. Um, great. So, Ben Blink from Google, we wanted to go to you next. Thanks. I'm Ben. I'm a member of our international policy team. Um, I focus on issues of freedom of expression. Um, I'd like to call out one specific uh, um, legal trend that is impacting millions of our users, and that's blogger media laws that are being proposed and passed around the globe. Um, these are laws that governments are enacting that state that any blog that has a certain number of users, many times just a few thousand, uh, register and are regulated uh, in their country, just like any major media outlet. Um, this is incredibly problematic because these laws often carry with them uh, criminalization of certain types of speech in very broad categories, things like divulging privileged data or quote unquote propaganda, um, things where, where governments have an excuse to prosecute someone uh, regardless of whether or not there's a major um, case for it. Uh, often these laws too are criminalizing anonymity so essentially uh, mandating that blogs uh, list the name and contact information um, of their owners. And in some instances, it's actually creating a registry of bloggers and others who are just reporting news um, in their country. So in addition just to be being generally against the, the international principles of freedom of expression and international human rights norms, um, this obviously has a major chilling effect uh, in these specific countries, um, uh, inhibiting people from blogging, from commercial standpoint from using our services, but more importantly from getting important information out to citizens. Um, it certainly also has a cascading effect. Uh, once these laws pass in one place, it's very, they are very quickly picked up and we start hearing conversations of these being passed um, in other places. Um, so criminalizing speech online is certainly not a new thing, uh, but in the last few years, uh, even with the last six months, it's been very surprising to see such um, 
strident uh, restrictions on just speech, not even under the auspices of child safety or national security, but just uh, suppressing news um, generally. So I think all of us need to be watching th this incredibly closely. Um, governments, uh, and specifically individuals in governments who are engaging at multi-stakeholder fora like this are often not the ones who are proposing and passing these laws, but it's incredibly important that they continue to uh, monitor their own internal government processes and uh, make sure that these types of laws are not, are not going through. Great. Thank you. That's perfect. And I'll just say one quick thing. Ben mentioned the Russian law. There's also a proposed law in Turkey that's currently waiting in Parliament amendments to the press law that's very similar that applies traditional news regulations to the online sphere. And that's one of the things that, again, we're looking at, we're seeing trends that mirror each other that converge across multiple countries. Um, okay, um, I guess, I guess the, the, the logical question to ask here at this point is, you know, how do we respond? Um, how do citizens and activists respond to these new threats uh, in cases where govern governments are overtly opposed to an open internet? That's the big uh, multi-million dollar question. So, but I, I want us to first focus on the technical solutions that, um, that uh, our activists and citizens have come up with on their own. Um, and first, uh, I'd like to um, uh, hand it over to Sarhat. Maybe he can talk to us about um, the MeshNet project that they have been, as a, as a pirate party movement of Turkey, have been launched um, over the summer. Thank you, Urju. Um, yeah. As a result of all of these uh, digital surveillance and then the recent uh, <coughs> change in Turkish uh, internet code 5651, uh, we of course ap uh, applied for our legal rights to the high court. And then, as a technical solution, we thought that we need the internet is not bound with uh, private sector or the government, and we researched on it. In fact, I'm a lawyer, IT specialized lawyer, but uh, we have a group. Uh, we have great people who, we, uh, lots of them are anonymous, in fact, we don't know them. And they helped us to build, somehow, build a mesh net in Turkey, and we are trying to uh, spread it. Uh, a mesh net is, in fact, uh, let me say, it's a secure commun communication, uh, which, are, which is primitive network of interconnected wireless routers that allow users to communicate relatively free. Uh, and besides that, in fact, we need a um, whistleblowing platform in Turkey because when we say that there is a internet censorship and we are in an era of digital surveillance, so a whistleblowing platform for journalists, that's another project of us, because currently whistleblowers barely ever leak to journalists in Turkey, and because anonymity software and understanding of anonymity is not widely used in Turkey. And I'd like to add another thing about the recent going on. As my colleague Gönent said, in this country, maybe uh, in the first time in the world, uh, the government hijacked DNS, free DNS. It's a big thing, I think, and it's reported in um, several reports. And uh, the government tried to track communications as well as to prevent users to circumvent the blocking orders. And uh, there was two cons uh, constitutional court orders about Twitter and YouTube ban that uh, saying these are infringement of all of the people's rights on internet and our officials uh, said that it's only 15 days Twitter ban was nothing and however despite these strong decisions saying that blockings are unconstitutional and infringed freedom of expression protected by Turkish constitution Twitter started to block access to certain Turkish Twitter accounts as well as individual tweets according to its withheld content policy recently changed, changed I think. And it's reported that um, Twitter complied with almost every government request or court decision coming from Turkey since they visited Turkish authorities two times, uh, I think in April and August. Yeah, and they continue to assist Turkish authorities uh, to censor really political content from Turkey. So Erdogan once said, uh, and threatened to eradicate Twitter to show the international community the power of the Turkish Republic. 
and but these moves are we thought that meant mainly to intimidate social media users so uh, i recently um, understood that they made an agreement with Turkish Telecom Authority to super tag the tweets on Twitter so Turkish Telecom Authority can uh, super tag as a, a tweet to withheld that tweet without a court order. So did we see the power of Turkish Republic or did we see the power of Turkish government or Turkish people? I do not understand that. One. So uh, this is my question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, at, at this point, I want I want to um, uh, introduce Carl. He he's got this uh, really fantastic um, initiative called Siphon. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Carl, and I'm from Siphon, based in Toronto, uh, in Canada. Uh, for those that don't know what Siphon is, it is uh, circumvention software. It actually started life uh, about 10 years ago in 2004 as a project at the Citizen Lab in the University of Toronto. Uh, a few years later, it spun out into its own company. Uh, we, we have multi-platform open source software. So we have a native Windows version for desktops and laptops. Uh, and we also have a native Android version for mobile devices. Um, to, to allow circumvention on other platforms, we also have a web proxy version, so we're actually available pretty much on, on every platform. Uh, some of the features of the software are, number one, that it's, it's open source, so it's available for peer review, it has been reviewed. Every time we commit a change, it's available for people to look at and see what it is that we're doing. We've also spent a lot of resource in building up a, an incredibly resilient network, so rather than just being a few direct servers that people can use as proxies, we, we have a, a very ephemeral network, so our servers are moving around a lot. We use different techniques to make sure that people who need to get access to content can do so. Um, the software itself is very easy to use. It's a simple one-click software. And because of this, it, it's actually meant that, particularly in times when uh, sites and services are suddenly blocked, uh, people are starting to, to flock to this software as soon as something, as soon as something happens. Uh, our distribution model is that we, we go through a number of different places. So we have uh, arrangements with some major broadcasters, international broadcasters, like Radio Free Europe, Deutsche Welle, BBC, and and so on, and they distribute our software so that their audience or their potential audience can see their, their size. Uh, and we also have versions available in the app stores, and uh, we've just recently launched an API, which means that people can build on top of our network to launch their own services. So all of this has meant that we've actually got a, a user base of several million people in uh, lots of different, different countries around the world. And as I said, as different sites and services are blocked, we're finding people coming very quickly to Siphon and also talking about it a lot over social media. That also means that as well as providing the software itself, we can also help um, in telling the story. So when, um, when services are being blocked, such as uh, Twitter in, uh, in Turkey earlier this year, and also social media in Iraq, then we've helped media organizations and research organizations tell the story by showing the spikes in use of our software compared to the unavailability of services in general. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so uh, when um, um, I guess um, how do we how do we support activists, journalists, and vulnerable political actors? That's the second question that we'd like to um, ask. Um, these the solutions could be also political, legal, or um, even educational uh, resources that we'd like to talk about at this um, in this section. Um, uh, first, I'd like to ask uh, Aslı Tunç, who's a professor at Bilgi University. Um, she's um, written fantastic uh, pieces. Her book is great. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Thank you, Burju, for your kind words also. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of problems in other countries, but uh, maybe I would like to focus on Turkey, uh, where we are suffering a lot in terms of journalism. Uh, actually, you know, for the whole week, we haven't, you know, talked about journalism and journalist problems much. We, we are talking about, you know, content, technical sides of the issue, governance, 
but uh, journalists are the you know most you know suffering actually uh, parties in especially in Turkey and in, in a lot of countries. So social media and internet creates an incredible platform uh, for citizen journalists to to join in and to create the pillar of democracy for 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 Turkey especially. So of course the governments and especially the Turkish government is very aware of this, you know, uh, power of social media. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of, of course, you know, short-term and long-term plans that can be done. Uh, short-term plans, of course, can be uh, to master uh, you know, of, of tools. In, in terms of citizen journalists. Uh, so we have talked about applications, you know, uh, a lot of softwares that can be taught to a lot of young people because Turkey is a very vibrant society and a lot of young people are very digital native in terms of social media. Um, but in the long run, of course, we have to create such an environment that, you know, the internet is indispensable for using you know, journalistic purposes. Uh, with training, you know, uh, of course with education because I'm, I'm, I'm a university professor, so I believe in long-term training sessions to spread the news to, especially Anatolia, uh, to a lot of, you know, uh, underprivileged uh, groups. Uh, but of course, news content is important, you know, uh, and we have to uh, create a, a solid, you know, journalistic uh, sphere because mass media, I mean, traditional media is so dysfunctional in this country. So we are relying on so much on social media's power to, to you know, spread the news and uh, to get the citizens informed. Um, so that's, you know, what we should fight for, uh, for, for the future, I guess. Thank you. Uh, from here, I, I'd like to um, maybe inquire how, how this has been handled in other places like uh, Pakistan. Um, I want to hear return to um, Shazad. Um, his organization, Bites for All, had just released a really fantastic report on hate speech. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, so we are we are doing uh, in in Pakistan. We are doing uh, two three different things. Uh, so. Uh, f f uh, foremost important is research. Uh, so we do uh, conduct research to build evidence. So evidence is uh, extremely important for uh, uh, for our advocacy campaigns. But um, we have been using this research for public interest litigation. Uh, so we realized that public interest litigation uh, and then taking these violations to the court of law is, is one way uh, that we can try to deal with it. So we have uh, three cases uh, against uh, government of Pakistan in different uh, courts uh, in the country. Uh, our uh, first case, which is a lot, uh, uh, it is, is uh, published about uh, in international media as well a lot. It's a net freedom case. Uh, uh, YouTube case, you, you may say, uh, it, it, it talks. It, it, the issues are much more wider than uh, YouTube ban. YouTube is banned for uh, about two, two years now in the in the country. Uh, but I mean, it also um, is uh, uh, about uh, um, uh, you know other uh, censorship issues and privacy issues. So uh, so this case is going on. We have had 20 hearings in in Lahore High Court, and the ca case has now been referred to Supreme Court, uh, and, and uh, we are going to start proceedings on that uh, in about two weeks time uh, so uh, so this is one one case the other case is about digital surveillance and where we are trying to uh, understand and find out uh, what kind of digital surveillance mechanisms uh, uh, government is uh, uh, deploying in Pakistan and uh, how it is uh, targeting human rights or, or, or citizens uh, and, and this uh, public interest litigation was the result of a research by citizen lab that they published uh, in, in 2013 uh, May 2013 uh, April 2013, uh, when they discovered Finn Fisher on Pakistani uh, in Pakistani cyberspace. The, the third case that we have is um, uh, that we have challenged uh, one of the law, which is extremely predictive, it's called Fair Trial Act 2013. Uh, so we have challenged that law as well uh, in, in Pakistani courts. So these are the three main cases that we are fighting. And taking this forward, and, and then we have a public campaign, it's called Access Is My Right campaign. Uh, and this is the campaign, you can look at it, accessismyright.pk, which is a 
visual based campaign where we want to uh, uh, engage with uh, common citizens mass, uh, uh, masses uh, and then bring them into this uh, discussion as well and the larger human rights movement also but uh, we uh, the, the another uh, aspect of it is our, our un advocacy so our uh, very important and a very successful uh, uh, intervention at the un human rights council was our uh, upr uh, that we did with uh, uh, freedom house and uh, apc um, uh, for the pakistan's upr and in 2012 uh, so uh, taking uh, f from 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 that uh, i mean we have been actively trying to follow up on on pakistan's uh, upr process because it is now part of the report uh, for the uh, for, for for pakistan and then we are actively following up with uh, eu human rights mechanisms as well uh, so i mean we are trying to uh, bring in all possible different avenues to fight this um, some are successful uh, some we still need to uh, i mean need to see how it will uh, work but i think uh, good research uh, and then possibly uh, uh, you know uh, good public interest litigation and particularly i would mention uh, that uh, there are out specialized uh, organizations out there who are out there to help uh, activists and human rights movement on all these different aspects and i will name media legal defense initiative for example they can help you uh, develop such uh, kind of litigation so i mean all these different uh, uh, aspects are important and useful and, and we are trying to uh, employ them in, in in our in our campaigns thank you thank you thank you um, um, uh, actually, he, he ended up in a really uh, good segue note uh, about raising awareness. I'd like to develop that further because IRPC Coalition has been really, really active about the raising awareness. We've uh, drafted, for the last five years, we've drafted the Charter of Internet Race, uh, Rights and Principles, and uh, we just launched the Turkish translation. So now I'd like to return to Selin Kaladelan, uh, who, um, who um, worked really hard to tr make this happen. Selin. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Burju. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Selin, uh, and I'm uh, I'm a lawyer in Turkey, and I took part of uh, the translation of uh, this uh, charter into Turkish, and I thank uh, Marianne on my left side, Robert. Burju and Freedom House for collaboration. It was a really nice work, and I was uh, I was the member in the final. But I mean, it was a tough work, and we managed well, I guess. So I mean, uh, first of all, I'd like to share my experience uh, regarding uh, this process, uh, the translation process, and uh, not as a translator, uh, but as a law practitioner. So I think um, this uh, charter will fill a gap for uh, human rights on the internet, and it's uh, some kind of uh, sort of a translation of human rights into internet environment. And I think it's it's really important. But I mean, I'm I'm going to uh, keep it short actually in my speech, and I would like I would like to share some uh, questions in the end. But I mean, uh, for instance, uh, Burju talked about the raising the awareness, and I think it's it's an impor important issue because, uh, for example, after issuance and introduction of this charter, um, there is a big burden. I mean, there will be a big burden on uh, the uh, government, on the civil communities, in respect of raising the awareness and education. So, and as I had talked about, uh, I just skipped to a Turkey case. Uh, we have a law maybe you are aware of, like 5651, and which has a really long name. Uh, if you let me, I will read its name, uh, which called a Code of Publications on the Internet and Suppression of Crimes Committed by Means of Such Publications, um, as known as a Censorship Law. And this law aims uh, to fight against the um, serious crimes, which we don't know what the, those are. Uh, and there are some examples in the charter, such as child pornography, drug traffic, and harmful content. 
and we don't know what the harmful, harmful content is, but um, based on harmful content, instead of taking down, they're just blocking and censoring the websites. Um, so I think uh, it's a big violation, not I think, uh, it's obvious, it's a big violation of freedom of speech and freedom of information. So uh, I just uh, give this example to uh, show how much EU is ready for this charter. I mean, uh, is there any legal background uh, in EU in accordance with this charter? For instance, uh, is UK or France uh, ready to implement and harmonize this charter in the existence of uh, Digital Economy Act or Hadopi Law? Or is this charter uh, or simil similar legislations are business friendly? Because I think uh, there will be a lot of problems uh, in the business sector in order to understand and uh, apply into practice. Thank you. Thank you, um, Selin. Um, I'd like to now ask uh, Sardin Bakhtin, uh, who's sitting over there, uh, what would Turkish activists need to make the internet a uh, democratic environment? Um, thank you. In Turkish, I'm, I'm going to talk about Turkey, but this applies to many different countries as well. So internet and new technology uh, new media technology has turned out to be a very important tool for civil society and NGOs. And they are uh, utilizing everything available in order to organize, campaign, and fundraise. And this turned out to be, both for civil society and citizens in general, um, a clear demand for uh, participation in decision-making processes. And this Demand is um, one of the main reasons why uh, many governments are trying to control, censor, and suppress um, internet communications. Um, in that regard, I take um, I can answer this question in three levels. On, on a national level, um, governments I think uh, should acknowledge this demand. This is not going away, and try to find ways and means in order to um, respond to this demand for participation. On an international level, uh, we can work on a global consensus of this participation, how to deal with it and how to convene it. And on a third level, um, internet and technology, um, civil society and NGOs need better tools to use data, raise issues and make demands. And like Shazad said, the most important thing for campaigning is evidence and reports. And if we, there are better tools to pull that data and implement it into reports and evidence for um, proving demands and the need for them, that will be um, very good for the civil society um, communications and demands in participation. Um, thank you. At this point, I think uh, um, I, we'd like to open up the session for a brief um, um, series of questions from the audience uh, um, because we've talked about a lot of issues at this point. I think this is a good um, breaking, you know, taking a break moment. Yeah. I'm going to take the privilege, though, of asking a first one. Uh, so think about your question for one minute. Um, I, I, there's been this discussion, this is part of the thing that's running an undercurrent through this whole week about the role that technical issue, technical fixes technological fixes play, especially regarding censorship. Um, and there is certainly a, a line of thinking about circumvention that, <clears throat> and about censorship and the problem of censorship and surveillance that we are now seeing so widespread that essentially what we're going to do, we have to do is just find technical fixes. And if we can get enough technical fixes, we're going to solve it. And, and Carl, we were talking about this a little yesterday. You had some really interesting things to say. So I wanted to turn that to you and then we'll go to the audience immediately. Sure. Thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's 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 different in many different places, but it's, it's pretty clear that there are resources being put into blocking content, whether that's a, a simple or you know, relatively simple DNS block, or whether 
um, some authorities, some, some places have uh, deeper controls in place. Um, and one of the things that we were talking about yesterday was, you know, is this just a, an arms race? Do we have to build something up and then see what see what happens to it? And you know, realistically, in in a way, that's that's right. So, you know, as um, as an organisation that provides a circumvention tool, we need to try and keep ahead of, of what's what's happening. Try and keep ahead of what people are doing. The the big issue is that, of course, you know, they they have the upper hand um, to a large degree because they know what they're going to do next, and we we don't. So we develop we. We develop software and we devote a lot of resources to trying to keep ahead, trying to, in a way, guess what's coming next. And sometimes, you know, we can we can fix things pretty much immediately when when the uh, when the game changes. Other times, it takes a lot of a lot of effort to do. Um, and I guess that you know, we the, the big problem for us is we can we can really only do what we have the funding, what we have the resources to do. We've um, we've got the ability to react when something happens, but. What we what's become increasingly obvious is that we need to be more than that, just one step ahead. We need to try and develop solutions that can, uh, in some ways, predict you know, what is the next level of blocking, what is the next thing that's going to happen, um, and you know, that, that I guess is where the difficulty comes in. You know, we, we've got a great team that can. Um, run a circumvention, run circumvention software, and that can you know, be ready for what happens next. What I'd really like to do is to be in a position where we can, you know, take a, a more sort of studied look at what is going to happen next. What are the capabilities that people have for blocking content, and look for ways that we can we can be, be prepared for the next generation of blocking and censorship. Great, thank you. Um, we'll take a couple questions from the audience. Anyone? Anyone have things to say, things to contribute? Yep, all the way in the back. If you'd identify yourself just by name and location or affiliation. Yeah, just come up to Just step up to one of the table mics. Um, uh, actually, it's to follow up on the statement just now. Um, one of the things that we found out in Malaysia when we were facing heavy blocks um, was that the re uh, over-reliance on internet technologies by could activists. You, could you speak to the microphone, Sorry. please? Yeah. Thanks. We found in Malaysia when we were facing um, heavy DDoS attacks of online um, sites and, um, and also the accounts of um, uh, what we say authoritative um, human rights organizations was an over-reliance on internet technologies. And we were, just as the previous uh, speaker was saying, that um, we were not prepared for the next steps and measures. So what I would like to ask is that um, if we're not prepared for this, should we also consider other alternative communications technologies, such as radio um, or mesh networks, should the government take the internet down um, in a last case scenario? Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, one of the things that, that we found obviously in, in running this software is that we, we can deal with a lot of things but as, as you're right to point out not when the, the whole internet is cut off so I think that you know, circumvention is part of a toolkit that people can have there are other ways of getting um, information between people of, of talking um, as you point out you know mesh networks while they're relatively new uh, could have quite a, an important role to play there as can more traditional forms of broadcast um, and we we work very closely with broadcasters and with other organisations to try and provide a part of a part of the service. Great, thank you. Um, is there another comment? Another question? Yeah, sir, hot, please. Thank you. I would like to add that um, I'm listening to participants and to, uh, talking in myself and trying to understand what I learned from my Jeff and during five days and I figured out that um, it's a shame for me to be in need of anonymity to express myself online. I'm repeating this sentence every time because I work for anonymity and I work for uh, anonymity to be accepted as a constitutional right in Turkey but I don't want to be in need of anonymity to express myself. It's a shame that I think, and about these VPNs, proxies, and other software f fighting for uh, surpassing censorship and privacy tools, we cannot trust them because there are lots of tools and new ones coming. Last one, 
and everybody uh, uh, asking us about them. For example, Lantern. They always t uh, ask us that is it trustable? Can, uh, did we, uh, should we install it or not? So nobody trusts those tools anymore because we know or uh, suspect that the governments are spreading them or something like that. So uh, the people doesn't know the things going on in the background of software, uh, doesn't want to use those tools or they use any tool and they can uh, use the wrong ones and uh, things uh, can go really wrong. Not the governments and the other uh, uh, organizations can track their information. Yeah, thank you. I think Carl you. wanted to say. Yep. So you have some very good points there, and uh, one of the f one of the features I mentioned of Siphon, and one thing that I think is really important, and not just for my software, but for any software that you use in this area, is that it's open source, and that's really a very very key thing. You know, we've made sure throughout the history of Siphon that it, it's it's been open source from the beginning. Uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, every time we make a change and deploy it, the source code is there for people to look at, to study, and to make sure. And while of, of course. Of course, we're a piece of software that is available to a mass audience, is used by a mass audience, and I realize that not everybody is going to be reading code and checking it, but I think you can be assured that when it's open source, there are enough people that have looked at it, that have reviewed it, and have made sure that it is you know, secure and doing what, what they say it is doing. So when you're looking for these tools, and I would say the same to anyone, um, anybody that's using any software like this, is to make sure that it's open source, and therefore you, know, you are at least one step on the way to having that trust verified on this, on this. Yeah. yeah on this topic briefly yeah. uh, quickly so in, in, my, in my opinion um, uh, digital surveillance is also uh, uh, very important uh, it's it's very uh, like growing issue uh, when it comes to freedom of expression or or, or so uh, I, in in our opinion uh, uh, censorship censorship you can circumvent uh, but but loss of privacy is permanent so that is why uh, it is important uh, that I mean we use these tools uh, uh, to, to to protect ourselves. Uh, so that is why I mean this is the importance of VPNs and importance of these tools. So I mean just a quick comment. Great. Thank you. Uh, we had a question there in the back. I saw it, you. Yep. Please identify yourself. Thanks. Uh, I'm Walid Al Sakaf. Uh, I happen to have been a victim of censorship. I'm. Yes, Walid Al Sakaf. Uh, I am from Yemen, but based in Sweden. I happen to have been a victim of censorship, and and uh, was temp contemplating the same ideas of trust when I started in 2008. But uh, what I realized is that the internet is so wonderful and so open that you no longer need to rely on others to begin circumventing censorship. So the idea behind behind it is that if you really are eager to build or develop your own methods of censorship, it's not that difficult. It's a matter of know-hows and understanding how the protocols work. So I would imagine that if you were interested in understanding how to evade, you can simply install a VPN on your server and that wouldn't take a half an hour or maybe one hour to finish. It's just a matter of understanding the know-hows and the trainings. And then you develop your own team to build your own tools. Uh, in the Middle East, where I come from, we had the same issue. So uh, I decided to build my own tool and it became successful. So it's not really a matter of um, uh, trying to trust others or uh, uh, making sure that there is something that fits you, but you can develop something that only fits you and customized for you. So that's the point I wanted to raise. Great. That's an excellent point. Um, I think Tanya, sorry, here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. My name is Sadaf Khan, and I'm from Bites for All Pakistan as well. Uh, I just wanted to come back to the question of technological versus political solution with a very quick comment. Uh, Carl used the analogy of an arms race, and I think it's the perfect analogy to actually make my point. If you look today, the superpowers in the world have arms to bomb the whole world 10 times over, but that hasn't stopped the wars, and that hasn't stopped the violence. So in terms of technology, the states will always have more resources than civil society, technology companies with fighting it over. And if we rely on these technological solutions, as important as they are, 
we are never really going to get ahead. It will always be a race when we are struggling to catch up. So we have to see these technological tech solutions as a tool of buying time to do a real policy advocacy where the blocking of the content, the censorship, the curbs on freedom of expression are illegal and the states can be held accountable for doing that instead of just finding ways to move around them. Thank you. That's a fantastic point. Thank you. Good, Nench. And then we'll, we're going to move on to another topic. I, I'd like to really thank the, the previous previous speaker, um, actually she's taken half of my speech uh, and, and done it in a more succinct and uh, a graceful manner. Um, I would definitely second what has been said. I'm not saying technical fixes are nothing, but they cannot be the end game. They cannot be the solution. They can just buy you some time until states get to that point of maturity where freedom of speech is the first virtue that they're, they're running after. So, uh, and it's not an awful thing when conflicts get deeper, by the way, uh, and when social media uh, accelerates that procedure, because when conflicts get deeper, uh, people will have to find a solution within the legal means, and uh, while, um, say, take the Turkish example, while uh, the uh, people in Turkey have agonized over uh, quite severe bans, ultimately, finally, as a, a teacher of freedom of speech for 10 years, now I have two court decisions that actually say something on freedom of speech. So that's not a bad thing. Uh, and uh, also, I'd like to... Um, underline the, uh, the point that Burju made, uh, we didn't elaborate on it, education issue. Uh, she said even education, and I understand because it's a very bottom-up kind of approach, but uh, again, uh, teaching at two universities and knowing how things are thought, uh, I would say that especially on concepts like freedom of speech, we should uh, uh, let people think outside the box, we should show them the red flags, instead of, of teaching people what freedom of speech is as a definition, we should start showing them the red flags. Like uh, uh, the uh, contributor from, from Google said, uh, uh, certain categories of speech are being attacked uh, under certain uh, legislations. And I would, I would say that there are a lot of lawyers in emerging markets who wouldn't see the big troubling problem with certain categories of speech being addressed. And they would look into what, what the categories are they would actually do a merits analysis of whether that, that category is really awful or not. They wouldn't say, the minute you categorize, you're already hindering freedom of speech. So red flags like that, vagueness, overbroadness, and, and all this, these need to be, uh, th to be uh, flagged and, and, and shown, and persistent objectors should be supported, be it NGOs, be it private companies. If they are persistently objecting in a jurisdiction, people should back them up because they're getting somewhere and those conflicts are not entirely awful for that nation. Meanwhile, of course, technical uh, fixes should allow people to still uh, stay connected, but that cannot be the end game. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Um, I, I completely agree and second what you just said. And I think that what we're trying, what we're getting at right now is that not one solution uh, is the be all end all, but a multi pronged solution um, that you know takes uh, legal side, you know, legal progresses and educational um, and uh, political and whatnot. So I'm completely in agreement with um, what Gunnett just said. Uh, I wanted to take one more question. Actually, we have a little more time. So Tanya. Um, this is a question for Asli, but also sort of for the rest of the panel. Um, uh, and I'm Tanya from Global Voices. So um, we talked a lot about the technical solutions, but I want to sort of drop back and circle back to what you said about forming the journalism public sphere. And um, this, a lot of this has to do with the academia and the academic sphere. And um, I think that that is also a really important component is how much freedom do you have to both teach and do research on net freedom and freedom of speech in Turkey and in other countries around the world. Um, and so, you know, so it's both about teaching students to use the tools and to understand how internet can be a tool for um, independent journalism, but also the freedom to do research. And if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, thank you. That's a great question, actually. Uh, well, I'm the lucky one because, you know, uh, my university is pretty progressive, so I have academic freedom uh, personally. But if you, you know, uh, look at the overall picture in the country, 
Of course, the intimidation you know, uh, goes to academia as well, including, I mean, journalists as well as academics. Uh, well, a lot of investigation uh, is being held, you know, for the academicians. So they don't have freedom to teach internet freedoms in classrooms and, you know, speaking to the public, to the media as well. So uh, they're mostly silent. Uh, they're self-censoring uh, themselves. Uh, so as I said, we are the lucky ones. Uh, so, you know, we have a bunch of people who are trying to raise the issue on an international level uh, by writing and, you know, speaking to the international media. But of course, we are blacklisted as well, uh, which we don't mind, but of course, we don't know what will happen to, to us. So nothing happens, you know, everything is vague in this country. Uh, but of course, there is a blanket of intimidation throughout this, especially state universities. They're not allowed to speak uh, or to, you know, be an activist uh, online and offline. Uh, so it's a pretty tough, you know, environment for academicians as well, sadly. <laughs> Okay, at this, at this point, um, I'd like to uh, widen the lens, lens a little bit and um, ask, you know, how should other stakeholders adapt and modify their support to address some of the threats and challenges that we've been discussing so far? Um, when, when I'm saying that, I, I'd like to focus on what's coming up next, the next frontier, what we should be thinking about for the future, not what's going on um, right now. Um, it, in a sense, how should the stakeholders collaborate um, to this end? Um, I'd like to uh, first uh, ask Anna to speak to this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Anna Kerfold uh, from the Swedish Development Agency, CEDA. Uh, so as, as others, uh, we're also a strong believer in the multidimensional approach of both supporting activists on the ground, but also working on a global level. Um, as many may know, Sweden was a driver in the, in the work of pushing through the two UN resolutions that um, confirm that human rights online should be, be treated equally as human rights offline. Um, and that's, that's, uh, those resolutions were, were both accepted with consensus and we see that this is an important base to, to have these kind of discussions. Um, within the, the Swedish development cooperation, we are, we are prioritizing uh, increased access and use of, of the kind of open and free communication channels that we're talking about now. Um, but also, um, as was mentioned by, by previous speakers, uh, this battle of technology is, is like you said, I think gonna, it, 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 it buys time, um, but we need, we need the other things in, in place as well. Um, I think we're at a very formative stage at this point. Uh, the African Union uh, just um, uh, went through with the, the Convention on Cybersecurity as well, leaving very vague uh, or using vague um, phrasings uh, that, that leaves a lot up to interpretation at country level. I think, uh, or as a strategy, we are encouraging South actors and local actors uh, and regional uh, collaborations to, to counter these trend, trends that we are uh, seeing. Um, I think the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms, uh, which we heard about this week, is a, is a wonderful example of, of, of regional initiatives, uh, pan-African in initiatives coming together and working uh, on these issues. Um, also, the, the dimension of, of offline human rights violation interacting with online human rights uh, violations, uh, I think, is also very important to address. Uh, and the specifics about human, women human rights defenders and the, the, um, uh, the challenges uh, they face. Um, we have also seen a lot of parallel, I think, also speaking about technology, but, but overall a lot of parallel initiatives. I think what, what we are trying to encourage is, is more of a collaboration and working together instead of sort of competing to each, against each other. And I think as donors, sometimes we are encouraging sort of a competitive structure. And I think we really need to be self-critical about that and see how we can remove those barriers that we may have helped to create uh, and, and help, to, help you to collaborate uh, with each other. 
Um, I also think that in in the sort of tech frenzy, we are sometimes looking at quick solutions, and just because technology is fast, we think that change is fast as well, and and we see a lot of short-term initiatives. But I think we need to really be uh, patient and see that also change in terms of online uh, rights takes time, and we need to invest in that time and commit to that time. Um, yeah, I'll stop there for now. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, Ben, our corporate representative, <laughs> Google, uh, to, for, to hear his thoughts on this matter. Um, so, so I think the most dangerous and, and troublesome forms of new censorship are well-intentioned laws that the general public can get behind. The ideas of child safety, of stopping hatred and extremism that are leading to more uh, broad uh, censorship that are just benefiting a few. And when the public is behind some of these efforts and aren't seeing the implications of some of these these laws, those those uh, pieces of legislation, court rulings, and other things are, are getting through. So I think as stakeholders, we have to look really carefully at each of these specific concerns the public legitimately has as the internet grows and, and broadens, and and develop solutions that are alternatives to this uh, censorship. Um, specifically, I'm th hate and extremism is one I think about a lot and uh, work on. Um, uh, in my work, and even in the U.S., certainly people are very concerned about th about those issues. And what we need to do is it, the burden is on us to demonstrate that things like counter speech, like speaking more, is a more effective solution than than, than pure censorship for the long term safety and security. Um, and you know things like um, uh, the moral norms of a society, something uh, by companies developing things like warning interstitials in front of videos that can help people stay safe and stay informed around those things. We can develop alternative solutions beyond blunt force censorship and get the public on our side um, as we try and combat some of these uh, censorship um, positions. Can I push you a little on that, Ben? <laughs> awesome. Uh, what 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 is Google? going to do about that? I mean, we're talking, you're talking about stakeholders, you're talking about, you know, everyone in the room, but specifically, I mean, as Google, as the 10 billion pound gorilla on the internet, like, yeah, how, how do you approach that? How are you going to support? Certainly. So, I mean, the burden is on us in many of these instances as well. You know, when people are demanding that YouTube videos are taken down and those types of things. So, um, from, from our perspective, you know, we work with individual stakeholder groups in specific countries to help them build their capacity to speak out against um, uh, certain things. So, for, for example, um, Muslim extremism in Great Britain um, is something that has led to um, many MPs there uh, demanding that certain content be removed or certain categories of content being removed. So us, you know, using our YouTube creator space in the UK or in LA, um, helping individuals who can, who are, are very well positioned to speak to communities about extremism, um, to help them build the capacity so they can make videos to counteract some of these things. So if something's posted, you can speak out against it as opposed to, to Google or a legal demand, just, just cutting it off entirely. Um, whether it's, you know, with child safety, it's a matter of educating parents and educating students about how they can stay safe online. We do a number of initiatives, um, both in, in person, like public fora, and um, online to help give them those tools to demonstrate that there are other ways to stay safe and that you have controls and parental controls to stay safe online beyond demanding that certain broad categories of speech, pornography, or other things be uh, banned online. So, I mean, we're always looking for new partnerships along those lines and looking for, for new ideas. Um, we're being big, we're well positioned in a place to help, but we're, again, we're always looking for those ideas. Um, thank you. I just want to kind of um, maybe second second one what you said in, in the first part of the um, statement that you made. You know, these, some of these laws, legislations are passed to protect public good, and public public always get behind it. Um, the same thing we, you've talked about mainly about censorship, but the same thing is true, especially true about surveillance, especially after 9/11. Some of the most outrageous surveillance legislation have passed in the states, um, and that kind of resulted from the the latest NSA leaks and what it revealed. So I, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nate. Okay. Um, at, at this time, we wanted to step up one more level um, to talk a bit about this whole week, since we're here on Friday morning, we're here at the end of the IGF uh, in Turkey um, with a lot of Turkish folks, with a lot of people who are in Turkey for the first time. And in particular, we wanted to talk about what this 
what these new threats, what this kind of environment means for the multi-stakeholder model. Um, what I hinted at at the beginning, what I talked about a little at the beginning. What, it, what does multi-stakeholderism mean if you have stakeholders that are not acting in good faith? And how do we uh, see the IGF process, um, perhaps other multi-stakeholder processes, uh, moving forward um, out of this? I wanted to actually ask Anna if she could say a few words. I know I put it in a very controversial way. Um, but uh, I would like to hear some perspective um, about the multi-stakeholder process, about the IGF, um, and how it's going to continue to work as we see this solidifying, um, these trends solidifying in a, in a very large number of countries representing a very large number of internet users. Thank you, Nate, for that question. Um, I think I will being within the development agency, I think I will step away a bit from the, the politics. <laughs> um, but, I mean, multi-stakeholderism is what we do. That's what, what we are supporting. We are supporting stakeholders to be able to have a voice in these kind of processes. We are support, supporting participants coming to the events. We are supporting the preparatory um, evidence-based reports that are being, um, being produced. Uh, so I think by, by strengthening uh, actors uh, involved in the dialogue, that's, that's multi-stakeholderism at practice. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to direct this question to Shazad, if I could. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, in my opinion, uh, okay, you mentioned IGF process as well, and uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, different stakeholders. Uh, though, I mean, situation or looks uh, very bleak, and uh, you know, it, it, it looks like it is, um, uh, it, it is it is really dark. No, it is not. I think uh, IGF process itself is important uh, to uh, continue to, to strengthen this whole idea of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, and and uh, we have been calling for it is continuation and uh, uh, and it is important for civil society. Uh, okay, I mean. The situation is bleak on, 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 on the side of several governments when they could not really make up to their uh, commitments to the Tunis agenda, for example, or then uh, the, the continued process. Not many governments are interested and they don't attend and they don't really, uh, m uh, you know, uh, work with civil society uh, at the national level or at the regional or global level. But still, uh, I think uh, we probably need to do a bit more effort and need to bring uh, continue to interact with them, continue to uh, make them accountable, continue to talk to them as well as, uh, uh, you know, accountability. I mean, with different measures that we can do, and hopefully at some point in time, we will get there. So, uh, uh, hopes are high, and, and uh, the IGF process, process is extremely important. It should continue, uh, and this is uh, where we can voice our concerns and voice our... Uh, so, so, this is uh, my... Thank you. That's great. I actually wanted to, Serhat, could I go to you? To I wanted to get a Turkish voice on this. Um, could I go to you for? Yeah. Thank you. I was talking about that in fact, and, and I feel that we we are in an oxymoron situation. The uh, country, I mean, the government seems democratic and it says it's advanced democracy and acts clearly a like a dictatorship. Privacy software says they are safe, but they uh, steal our privacy themselves. Uh, so as for the social media platforms, uh, please do not forget they are companies, they are, they are not fighters for freedom of speech. Maybe they say they are, but <laughs> not. Uh, they want to profit from our online activity. So we have via their services. So uh, we didn't establish those companies, platforms, softwares as the as a stakeholder, as people. I'm a citizen. I'm a stakeholder. I think I'm a user, but uh, th this is not taken a stakeholder in Turkey in the terms of the government and the uh, national assembly. So, as a stakeholder, uh, we build and th this country and the government is established on people. I think so. We can change it. 
the laws are being prepared in the assembly, National Assembly of Turkey. So, yeah, education is important, software is important, law is important, A applying law is important, but going in assembly and fighting for internet freedom in assembly is important too, so we should work for it too, uh, as a political thing. I want to add that uh, there is a connection with political way as a stakeholder to act as politically on this issue. Thank you. Um, at this point, uh, Selin also wants to add something. This is a very popular question, by the way. Uh, I just want to uh, point out that when I talk to people, I mean uh, the people who are not uh, lawyers or law practitioners, when I uh, talk about the surveillance and the data protection, uh, they just tell me that, okay, I trust my government, so uh, it collects my data. It's good, right? And I say, I mean, do you aware of uh, the danger and what's going on? And I mean, uh, I can't fully understand this trust uh, of the citizens to their governments. And they don't think about uh, what, what this data, where this data goes. For example, maybe Sayhat uh, can help me out uh, about this, um, you know, they were locked up all the information, uh, the data, I, I, don't, I don't remember where they are, but I mean, they had the code, the pass password was one, two, three, four. And uh, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, it was nice actually. But I mean, uh, when we talk about uh, the education, uh, I was thinking about why should we start? For example, when I just uh, take this kind of comments that, like, uh, okay, I trust my government, so I don't, I don't care where this data goes. So I mean, I just want to into my uh, daily life, and I don't care about the surveillance. But for example, when we are talking about the Google, and I think that uh, I mean. Uh, and right now, the biggest surveillance tool in the world is the Google. So, um, yeah, I think uh, the internet that we are using right now is fully censored because it's dominated by Google. So, are we using the real internet? So, that will be the question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I guess we could say just corporations in general instead of just pinpointing Google. Although, oh, actually, do, Ben, would you like to defend your uh, turf? <laughs> I, I didn't want you to get, you know, trampled upon, but, you know, he's, he's your friend, so he wants you to. No, it's okay. I mean, I, I don't quite see the connection how, our, you know, Google's um, role is leading to, to censorship directly. Um, but like, I'm happy to talk more about that later. Um, you know, I think it's certainly very healthy to be aware of the internet space and who's playing in that space and those types of things. And I think it's every you know company should be um, looked at in, in made sh making sure that they're following standards that are respecting human rights and other things. And I think that's completely uh, reasonable and legitimate for everyone um, to be doing as well. Um, I'm, for us, I don't think we need to get into defending you know personally or other other corporations generally. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with where we the steps that we're taking to mitigate the risks of surveillance and government intrusion and the legal review process that we have in place to review government requests and to, to mitigate the threats to our users as much as possible. Um, companies are generally based on trust and users have many options in, in these spaces and if we're, if we're not protecting that trust of our users then our business is completely going to fail. Um, so it's certainly within the interests of forward-thinking companies to be thinking about the surveillance uh, implications and security and privacy of their users overall. Uh, in the spirit of true interactive dialogue, um, Gyunanch wants to say a few words about this issue. Thank you. Um, not about this issue. I, I agree that uh, it, you know th that last exchange is not what Nate was asking about. I think, and and Nate's question I think is an important question. Uh, what is it uh, that is so special about multi-stakeholderism and what is it really? Uh, to me, uh, my perception is that multi-stakeholderism is uh, trying to penetrate a bottom-up approach rather than uh, a top-down type of, of attitude toward issues of internet. So who's the true owner of internet? It's the people. So how do we get the people say what they want to say about its governance? Multi-stakeholderism is a, uh, a concept of that, in, in my mind. And uh, with that, I think the IGF being held in Turkey was a wonderful thing. 
because um, if you're going to study poverty or, or um, uh, inequality in, in uh, uh, income distribution, you should do that in Mozambique or, or Haiti or uh, Congo. And if you're going to look into uh, severe issues of internet governance, I think it's wise to do it in Turkey right now because we have severe issues of internet governance. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that for five days people discussed it in the core of, of these. And, and I do agree with part of what has been said that you don't smell it in the air either. It's, it, it doesn't occur to you like a country where there is there is uh, these severe problems. These severe problems they they uh, spring at you when when it is crunch time. So you need freedom of speech when you are annoying someone. But that's when freedom of speech kicks in anyway. So uh, to make a long story short, what I'm trying to say is I think it was a blessing to have the IGF in, in Istanbul. And I think the multi-stakeholderism is um, wonderful to the extent that uh, 9, 9 a.m. in the morning, this room was so crowded and people get to know each other and it's a, it's a great network. Uh, we, I know who to reach out to, people know how to place each other and, and the IGF is, is serving uh, the true owners of internet more than it serves uh, the ideals of, of censorship or, or uh, profit gaining. Yeah, th thank you for this insight. Um, uh, Marianne from IRP uh, Coalition, she, she was the co-chair until yesterday, um, but she'd like to say a few words. I'm just wanting to return to the idea about that um, even talking about basic human rights online and offline in a university classroom puts you in danger. And I think this is something that we need to take account of that even down to high, uh, primary school and high school, there must be a way in which you can actually socialize and sensitize young people to understanding what a right is without necessarily incurring the wrath of your, of your watchers. So I'm concerned, one, that they, even those spaces are being invaded by um, forces that would wish conversations about rights to be curtailed. But I, I also want to emphasize the little stuff the, the, the tiny everyday stuff that isn't something you can hang up as an output. Things like handing the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet in Turkish to my hotel, hotel, manage, hotel boys at the front desk and to have them actually arguing with each other about who gets the copy. Right? These little things, no, our names aren't attached to them. No, we can't get funders, we can't tell funders about this. But I think it's these little things that we often forget with these big high talks. So multi-stakeholderism is what you make of it. So as we're at high level, middle level, I think we need to find, I'd like to find ways how we can help people in schools and universities in Turkey and other places to bring forth these values and ideas in ways that get people to think differently. We're changing mindsets that does not happen overnight. But in this case, do sweat the small stuff. Do sweat the small stuff. If you know the reference I'm making to that American book. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Uh, we do have time now for some more questions uh, before we get to the wrap-up. So I wanted to, you know, open up audience. I'd seen a couple of hands passing through uh, and haven't always gotten to them. So if you still have those inquiries, if you're still here, if you still have something that has sparked your thoughts, if there are people from Turkey who want to talk about what this has been like, um, any perspectives that you have about what's been happening this week. We'd love to hear it. Don't be shy. Yeah, Sirdar. Um, I could say a few words about um, IGF being in Turkey, but we not really being able to talk about Turkey. And that was something that we, we spent these five days very productively, but um, that was about mostly global issue, but since, um, as you said, Turkey is the case study, we could not really focus on the concrete examples that are actually taking place. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and dive in on that. Uh, you know, I think it, 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 you have a forum, and this is maybe to sharpen the point, you've got a forum that's a multi-stakeholder forum where individual governments are allowed to promote themselves. Um, literally promote themselves, produce promotional materials and distribute them. But NGOs are not allowed to distribute uh, reports and, and materials that pr present an alternative view on those governments or corporations. 
And I think that is really calls into question what multi-stakeholderism is and how equal the stakeholders are. Uh, I do think that at the current stage of it, from my impression from this week, there are some stakeholders that are definitely more equal than others right now. And that's something that I'd uh, like to see as the IGF goes forward. Um, how are we going to make it so that it's more of a balanced uh, approach? Arzu? Um, a great point. Thank you, Nate, for saying this because I, am, um, I come from Azerbaijan where IGF was hosted two years ago um, and things haven't really improved there. In fact, it's gone pretty, pretty backwards. Um, so one thing I would really like to see leaving IGF this year is, you know, we've been using the word accountability quite a few times at IGFs. And I think we really need to start taking this word seriously because one thing is saying the word accountability and the other is actually doing something about it. And I would really like to see the multi-stakeholders at the IGF to do something about accountability, especially holding governments like Turkey, like Azerbaijan, accountable to all the violations that are happening in those countries um, against the journalists, against bloggers, against activists who are using online platforms for their work. Thank you. Great. Questions? Comments? Yeah, owner. Oh, no. Anywhere you see a mic, just squeeze in. Just please yeah. speak to the mic, yeah, just get but close very to close. It. Um, hello. My, no. My name is Onur. I'm working for um, a multi-stakeholder digital news agency in Turkey. We have been trying to find a digital agency with 26 street journalism and independent journalism projects uh, all over Turkey from different backgrounds. And we are struggling with the multi-stakeholder approach as well because it's new. And uh, there are uh, some points that I want to comment on. Uh, it's the one that, like, uh, first of all, uh, some countries and some parties of uh, some parts of the countries are already uh, a bit more equal than the others. For example, we have some parties in the Arbaker. They don't have the wi uh, 3G or Wi-Fi within the Arbaker streets, so it's impossible for us to get uh, some uh, pictures or videos from the internet. And also, we had experience for, let's say, Labor Day, 1st of May. Uh, we had done for, uh, 53 hours of live broadcast, but we didn't able to process them through the uh, through live stream because the internet wasn't on. And we couldn't able to track that because the tracking mechanisms also work with the internet, and we didn't have the internet to track it as well. And also, uh, there is this other thing where I thing the internet comes from skipped right away is it's the thing that uh, there is a technological gap. I have been training myself for the last 10 years about the internet and the tools and everything and working as an activist. Before this, I was working for a media, big media corporation. I got fired uh, during the Giza protest, but uh, then I take my expertise to the independent journalists and the street level. But I've uh, realized that there's this huge gap between uh, the, the awareness of technology and how uh, people can use those technologies within their lives in the Netherlands that I experienced earlier, and in Istanbul, and also in Izmir. So when you develop new standards, uh, new perspectives on how to govern the internet, how to uh, distribute the information, or how to set the laws for this, there is this huge gap uh, between the understanding of what the internet is, what information is, what is necessary. So when you go to like local parts of Turkey, people are not using as internet as uh, in Istanbul or in the European countries. Most of the user behavior is still in as like in the 80s. People get to watch the TV, and internet is a child's story still. So there is this necessity for uh, the big guys like you and like the, the uh, lawmakers to understand this gap and maybe work on the next five billion a bit more before progressing the whole thing or making it more open in the way where technology and the understanding of technology and how it actually affects our lives can be more spread out. Because I believe that instead of like just one billion working for six billion, it will be a lot easier if we work six billion altogether. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, John. <coughs> Thank you, Nate. Um, yeah, I do introduce, agree. introduce yourself. Yeah, sorry. Johan Bier from Reporters at Borders. Uh, I do totally agree um, with what has been said in terms of the opportunity that this event represents in terms of networking, etc. And I do also agree, uh, sadly, on the fact that this is the first time I've, I've heard specific problems in Turkey discussed uh, in this forum. So I'm really glad that this was uh, indeed addressed uh, in, in this workshop. I just wonder whether uh, there are in this room uh, UN, IGF, BTK representatives uh, and well so that these, ch these issues are actually uh, addressed and that uh, these problems are discussed and that someone actually acts on it and uh, well all the, all the issues like how the, um, the, the workshops are, are agreed, how the big and small rooms are distributed and well will this change next year or not? Thanks very much. Thank you. Is there someone here? Yes. Ah. Hi, I'm Deniz, and I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, but I'm here through an international civil society organization, Access. And I would like to thank all of the participants, and I especially appreciated the comments about how to engage the youth um, in Turkey when it comes to internet governance. And I think I will direct my question to Serhat and others. Um, what do you think um, the Turkish civil society organizations who are now aware of the multi-stakeholder process and aware of this issue in its entirety will strategize after this in order to um, engage the youth in Turkey, which has a huge potential as we have seen before? Short. <laughs> Yeah, we because we still have to wrap up. It's, but yeah, uh, easy answer. answer is really short. In fact, we we have so few NGOs in Turkey really fighting for internet freedom, and they are divided and not connected to each other. We don't have a coordination. Lots of problems between NGOs. We are trying to establish good connection between NGOs right now in Turkey. Okay, great. Um, we're pretty much coming to the end. I, I want to do a very quick sum up of some key points. Um, this will be necessarily fragmented because it's been a very wide-ranging discussion and I think a very good discussion. Um, but just some things that really stuck out to me as far as I'll start with solutions, um, approaches, which is the beginning point of this discussion. Evidence, evidence, evidence. This came up from multiple people, multiple stakeholders. How do we um, enable uh, the society. And we always say civil society, but I don't really like that word because it always sounds like NGOs. How do we enable society to document, monitor, report? And there are specific things that can be done. Stakeholders like Google can maximize their transparency, can maximize the reporting, they can, and like Twitter, they can maximize the reporting, maximize the transparency not just on the results, but on the process when removal requests are made, when um, user data requests are made. Not just, so it's not just we did X number of this, it's how did we do it? How did we make that decision? We have those conversations here at IGF directly, but that's not an opportunity that almost 100% of users have. Um, also, it, it's a, the transparency is also a mandate, I think, for creators of tools, like Carl was talking about, about open source and about being transparent about how the tools are created, about how the tools work, making it so that they're accessible, um, and, and making them so that they can be adapted in ways that we can maximize the evidence that we collect that we can use to report on what's happening. Um, it's also about developing capacity for how other stakeholders in civil society, in society, use these, this data, and it's about access to the data itself. Um, it, the, and this is something Serdar's talked a lot about this week. I think it's a really big issue that we want to push, is that there's a lot of information that's created on the internet that can be used really effectively for advocacy. Um, but we need capacity in NGOs and in civil society and in researchers and advocates on how to access that data, how to use that data, and how to turn it into um, effective products um, for advocacy. Um, Another point that I think was very helpful that was very good in our discussion on technology was about getting a step ahead. Um, acknowledging that the technological fixes are only buying time. I, I, I 
personally think that was a pretty good point that we're, we're only going to be buying time to try to develop the actual policy solutions, which are also political solutions, which are also solutions about, you know, actual national governance. Um, but they're still necessary, and the key is to try to get to where we're not just putting out fires, and we're not just responding to the last one, but we're actually looking at kind of the way you would in a sporting event or in a, a game where the rules are somewhat set. Um, there are a certain limited number of options that are available for the offense, and there's a certain limited number of options that are available for the defense, and the offense doesn't always win. Um, if you can get to where you have enough resources and you can actually plan for the game. Um, and last on multi-stakeholderism, uh, I will leave open, you know, for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week, for the rest of the year, for the rest of our lives, what uh, this has meant for Turkey. Um, I encourage everyone to, you know, talk to the Turks who are here, of course, but the ungovernance forum that's going on today. There's a great program, especially on citizen journalism this afternoon. Um, I encourage people to go to that, you know, learn about what's happening here in Turkey and why it's so incredible and why the situation is being met with such force and violence and repression. Um, learn about these specific people, meet these people. They're doing really amazing stuff. Um, and at the same time, and this may be paradoxical, uh, I, I, I feel this has been a very productive week for engaging a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise be engaged with Turkey um, on that question. And so I, I think this has been very productive and I look forward to talking with the rest of you about this. I want to thank all of our workshop participants for being brief, being on point, being you know engaged and thank you all for this workshop. Yeah, I, I, as the timekeeper, I would like to personally thank our panelists for being on time, but I also would like to uh, thank our, the people, our audience. Uh, it, as I said, it's a 9 a.m. panel in the last day. We weren't very hopeful. We've been tweeting about it, but we were kind of like, uh, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.